Coming up on 2020 on ID, college, webcams, and sex. And we can tell that they're kissing. And we were just like, oh my God. The mystery date in a dorm room while a webcam watches and a roommate tweets about Tyler Clemente's most private moments. Did you want to shame him? No, not at all. Then why did he jump off the George Washington Bridge just three days later? What goes through your mind? First thought, I started blaming myself. And he's not the only one. Darun Ravi was a bully. Isn't it about time that a bully in America doesn't get off? A trial and a verdict. Count one. I mean, my reaction was, how did they, how did they come up with this? And now, Darun Ravi tells his side of the story. Did you bully Tyler Clemente? Unforeseen consequences. Plus, a single dad in a small town suddenly under attack. It's all about being a perv. Anonymous online gossip. How are you going to defend yourself against somebody who you don't know who it is that's doing the attacking? With devastating results. She was suicidal. But this battle is just beginning. These bastards don't get away with it anymore. Hello and welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It only takes the click of a keyboard and an impulse or a grudge is racing along an uncontrollable path. First, two typical kids starting college for the very first time, but one of them ends up dead just 25 days into his freshman year. The question, what really happened when one of them got sexiled, kicked out of his room when his roommate had a date? For more than a year, Darun Ravi remained silent on what took place after that dorm room door closed. But in 2012, he spoke out for the first time, telling Chris Cuomo his side of the story that rocked a nation. It's impossible to know what flashed through the mind of Tyler Clemente as he walked the pathway of the George Washington Bridge in New York City on the evening of September 22, 2010. What we do know is that at 8.42 p.m., the 18-year-old college freshman sent this Facebook message from his cell phone. Jumping off the GW Bridge. Sorry. Tyler's life ended that night 200 feet below in the Hudson River. A death that sparked a chain reaction, generating a media and cultural firestorm. If you are someone who is being picked on or bullied, or called names. It also transformed Tyler's roommate at Rutgers University, a slender frisbee throwing freshman named Darun Ravi, into a convicted felon facing 10 years in prison. Do you think people know who you are? I really don't. They thought like, I hated gay people and I wanted to intimidate them. And that stuff doesn't even make sense to me. How do you shift? Darun Ravi excoriated for provoking Tyler's suicide by harassing the gay teenager online. He speaks out for the first time. You're, not, you're never gonna be able to go back in time and change what's happened. All you can do is learn from it. Born in Southern India, Darun grew up in the suburban New Jersey town of Plainsboro. Darun was known as bright, inquisitive, thrilled to be heading to college. I just wanted to learn how to live on my own, how to take care of myself, how to make my own decisions. I was very excited and I wanted to meet new people. In contrast to the hypersocial Darun, Tyler Clemente was shy, reserved, a self-described loner. A skilled violinist who played in the Ridgewood, New Jersey Symphony. Tyler also happened to be gay, something he told his parents right before he left for college. He was really a great kid to have around, have around the house, very helpful very kind, uh, generous with his time. And when he practiced his violin, it was like a concert every night. Darun found out for himself that Tyler was gay during an online search about his prospective college roommate. That's when he discovered a post from Tyler on a gay website. What did it mean to you that he was gay? It didn't mean anything, it was just, it was just an interesting fact. Like almost every fact that Darun thought was interesting, he decided to tweet it. Like most teens, Darun was hopelessly addicted to social media. You like to tweet. Yeah. But what does social media mean to you guys today? When you type it, does it mean you mean it more than no, if you say it? It's probably opposite. What most people type is like wrapped with seven layers of sarcasm and you know, another layer of irony. But what Darun said online would play a huge role in the case. 
starting with his first instant message about his new roommate. F*** my life. He's gay. Why were you doing that? Was it because you hate gays? You're afraid of gays? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, these are my closest friends. They know me. They know I don't... I have no problem with gay people, so... And I have no problem with any kind of people. What you guys were doing was not necessarily uncommon, but do you see that it wasn't really nice either? Why that language? That's just... That was a normal way that kids talk to each other. We were, we're not really thinking about... You know, what if someone else reads this? How are they gonna feel? August 28, 2010. Ravi and Tyler head to the Rutgers campus in New Jersey for move-in day and meet for the first time in the Davidson C dorm room. He was very shy, very polite, very quiet. I would try to have conversations with him, but they fizzle out really quick. I mean, I, I tried very hard. Did you ever ask him, hey, or say, hey, I know you're gay? <laughs> what I figured was after seeing how shy and quiet he was, I thought he was very reserved about it. So I didn't want to go and ask him, hey, are you gay? A and, um, I don't know, I don't know how, if he was out or anything. Um, initially, I didn't know that. Meanwhile, Tyler messaged a friend with his own off-color impressions of his new roommate. I got an Asian, and commenting that Ravi's parents definitely owned a Dunkin' Donuts. Almost immediately, the two freshmen set off on different paths. Tyler joins the school orchestra mostly keeps to himself. I wasn't sure if he had any friends at all. I never saw him interacting with anyone in the dorm. Darun takes immediately to college social life, joining the ultimate Frisbee team and becoming known for his unique sense of humor. If he could poke jokes at you, he could push it too far. He felt he was strong enough to take those kind of jokes. Maybe he wouldn't understand that some other people weren't as strong as he to take those. But while Ravi may have been more outgoing, it would be the reclusive Tyler who would score the first date in college on September 19th, what would turn out to be a fateful event. I he says, hey, is it okay if I have a friend over? When did you meet the friend? The guy walks in, he's clearly older than us. I look at him and I say hi, and he immediately averts his eyes, looks on the ground, and his expression, he looked a little bit angry. I don't, I don't know why, kind of like a mean expression. Uneasy about Tyler's friend, Darun says he headed across the hall to the room of Molly Way, a classmate from his high school. I tell her, Molly, there's just really weird guy in my room. And she's like, oh, what does he look like? Um, I'm trying to describe him. And I'm like, you know what, I can just show you. Turns out the tech savvy Darun had rigged the webcam on his computer to turn on by remote. And I turn it on and then we looked at it and we can tell that they're kissing. And it registered to both of us what happened at the same time. And I, and I closed it and we were just like, oh my God. When you turned on the camera, did you think that you were going to interrupt a romance? No, because you have to keep in mind that this was less than a minute after I left the room. Did it seem that weird, or was it just kissing, basically, with two people the same gender? No one, no one cared about that. You weren't looking to invade him, figure out what's going on, shame him? No, I had nothing to do with Tyler at all. Yet Ravi immediately tweeted all his friends. Roommate asked for the room till midnight. I went into Molly's room and turned on my webcam. I saw him making out with a dude. Yay. And why did you send it? I wanted to let my friends from back home know. In my head, that's just how Twitter was. Twitter was, we'd kind of still be involved in each other's lives and what's going on. But it is not just Darun's hometown friends who read the tweet. Tyler Clementi also sees it the next day. At first, Tyler seems to dismiss the incident, messaging a friend that it's not like he left the cam on or recorded or anything. Later, he posts messages on a gay website writing, I'm kind of pissed at him, but I don't know if I have enough to get him in trouble. He never saw anything pornographic. Despite all of the online angst, the two say nothing to each other in person. If they had, it may have changed everything. So I figured, you know, I, I, I would eventually tell him someday down the road, and it would be kind of something we would laugh at then. A day later, on September 21st, Darun is sexiled from his room once again. Tyler has scheduled another date with his mysterious friend. My concerns were two things, that this would become too regular, and second, I did not trust the guy still that was there. Instead of addressing those concerns with Tyler, Ravi once again decides to tweet. Anyone with iChat, I dare you to video chat me between the hours of 9.30 p.m. till midnight. Yes, it's happening again. Ravi even sent a text saying, people are having a viewing party with a bottle of Bacardi and beer. Was there going to be a viewing party? 
No, that was just, that was me fooling around with my friends. Just looking back, I was very self-absorbed with the whole thing. It was just about what I was thinking, what I was, how I was reacting to everything. I, I never, it was never, what if Tyler finds out? How is he going to feel about it? In fact, Tyler had found out. He'd been checking Ravi's Twitter feed. Tyler even unplugs Ravi's computer before his date that night. He also files a complaint with his resident assistant and asks for a room change. He writes, I feel that my privacy has been violated and I am extremely uncomfortable sharing a room with someone who would act in this wildly inappropriate manner. When you saw Tyler the next day, did he react to you like he knew something was up? No, not at all. At the time, Ravi was unaware that Tyler knew all about the webcam spying. Yeah, he seemed completely normal to me. Did you think you had done something wrong? Well, yes, that the first night I shouldn't have looked ever. That's what I thought. So I figured I should explain that to Tyler. But would he get that chance? Events were now in motion that would change Ravi's life forever and bring Tyler's to a sudden end. Stay with us. The death of Tyler Clemente wasn't just another random teen suicide. His death has sparked a vast debate over gay bullying. It coincided perfectly with a cresting wave of public outrage against bullying of gay teens and a series of headline-grabbing suicides. We have the power to make it better. On September 21st, 2010, the same day Tyler complained about Ravi's webcam spying, syndicated columnist and gay rights activist Dan Savage had launched his It Gets Better campaign. You have to live your life so that you're around for it to get amazing, and it can and it will. But that message never reached Tyler Clemente. He jumped to his death the very next day. We were devastated by the loss of our son, and, and we still are. As the Clementes grieve, the It Gets Better campaign catches fire. It gets better. Celebrities, politicians, even companies like Google immediately jump on board the anti-bullying bandwagon. His death really um, took the whole issue up to a, a whole other level and um, exploded. Savage says it was the result of an unfortunate mob mentality, and that explosion was about to blow Darun Ravi to smithereens. There was finally a face that people could put to the bullying. There was finally a villain. He was outed as being gay on the internet, and he killed himself. Celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres sounded the alarm. Lady Gaga joins in, tweeting, bullying must become illegal. It is a hate crime. Even President Obama chimes in on YouTube. It breaks my heart. It's something that just shouldn't happen in this country. And what follows is a string of allegations, one worse than the next. The public is led to believe that Ravi not only watched Tyler having sex with his male lover, but that he secretly recorded the act, posted the video online, and outed his roommate out of spite. How is that hitting you? I was angry that people would make these statements without knowing what the details were. I felt like I was being used by every, everybody. And sure enough, much of what was reported turned out to be wrong. Did you out Tyler Clemente? No. But then when he brought a guy over and he walked him in, and he does this in front of everyone. He doesn't care. He's, he's okay with it. Did you record him having sex? No. Did you put anything online of him having sex? No. Did you put people together and broadcast him having sex? No, none of that happened. But it was all said, and people believed it. Yeah. And what did that make you? It made me the worst possible person. You are the face of the bully. Yeah. But Ravi says when he first heard Tyler was missing, he was deeply concerned. His suspicions directed at that mystery date Tyler brought into his room, known as MB. My first thought was M it was MB. He got mixed up with the wrong guy and now something's happened to him. What was going through my head is, I wish I recorded something so I would have an image of this guy to give to the police. Were you sad when you found out that Tyler was dead? Yes. I mean, I couldn't even fathom this happening, this kid that I knew. It was hard for me to deal with how normal he seemed. The reticent violinist had been in turmoil. Unbeknownst to Ravi and lost in the media crush, Tyler had been writing about his own depression 
his loneliness, and the rejection he felt after coming out to his parents. I was very surprised, and it, it was um, startling for me. No one knew exactly why Tyler Clementi killed himself, but yeah. Ravi felt oh, he might have had something to do with it. What goes through your mind? First thought, I started blaming myself. Is this because of me? Why would it be because of you? Tyler thought, you know, a bunch of people saw him having sex, so I thought it was too much for him to take. And investigators quickly uncover evidence of that guilt. Deleted tweets and texts encouraging his friend Molly to tell police the first webcam viewing was accidental. What was going on in your mind? Why were you doing those things? I was trying to fix what happened. That's all I was thinking about. Was it, I know I committed crimes, I want to cover those up? No, it was, not, it was none of that. The police are less understanding. I'll tell you now, we have your computers. Yeah. Okay, we're going to know what you put out over the internet, who you tweeted. What they bring Ravi in for some aggressive questioning. We know that you deliberately planned and set this up, okay? This is something you spoke about doing before you did it. They came away from it feeling that you lied to them. You know, that's how it was portrayed in the end. Did you bully Tyler Clemente? No, I didn't bully Tyler Clemente. Do you think you misunderstood how fragile he was? I really don't think he was very fragile. I think he just didn't like talking to people. That's, that's the only thing I got from him. I don't think, you know, just because he's gay doesn't mean he's automatically fragile and can't deal with anything. How could he not be fragile and have jumped off the George Washington Bridge? Um, something had to be very wrong, right? It yeah, wasn't something an accident. Be, something had to be very wrong. Very and something was wrong. Ravi learned Tyler complained about him. So he sent his roommate a poignant and revealing text message. You told him that you knew he was gay from the beginning. You told him that it wasn't a problem for you and that this was a misunderstanding and that you had guilt. Yeah. Why did you want him to know these things? When I sent that, all I knew was that he wanted a room change. So I figured I needed to tell him that he shouldn't feel pressured to do this, like this is his only choice. I wanted to understand that I'm not there to, to make him feel like, intimidated or anything. However, that text doesn't stop authorities from bringing a case. The Middlesex County prosecutors hand down a 15 count indictment. The major charge is bias intimidation, a hate crime in New Jersey. There are also multiple charges of invasion of privacy, as well as witness and evidence tampering. He invaded Tyler Clemente's privacy repeatedly, and he did commit a hate crime. His Twitter feed said, whoa, he's making out with a dude, yay. If that's not a bias crime, what is? Punching him in the face and saying something nasty about him being gay. Is that what our society has to come to, Chris? The fact is that invasion of privacy and words do devastate. Steve Goldstein is the chairman and CEO of Garden State Equality and the first to call Tyler Clemente's death a hate crime. The impact that it had, those words had on Tyler Clemente were devastating. How do we know? Chris, some tragedies are so awful, they speak for themselves. Can you think of another cyberbullying case where none of the electronic messages were directed to the victim? I, would, I don't have an answer to that. I would have to check. I can't find one. The case is unusual enough that the prosecution offers a plea deal. They say no jail, community service. But what was the but? That I had to go up there in front of the judge under oath and say that I did this because I had this hate for gay people. That's just something I could never do. I mean, people always ask, you know, you might regret not taking the plea deal one day. I told them, you know what, I'm never going to regret not taking the plea deal. What I would regret is not even fighting for my side of the story. Coming up, Darun Ravi takes that fight to a New Jersey courtroom. But will his own tweets, texts, and a parade of classmates send him to prison for 10 years? Stay with us. Darun Ravi has been charged with 15 counts related to spying on college roommate Tyler Clementi with a webcam. Ravi has refused a plea deal rather than admit he was motivated by anti-gay bias. Now it'll be up to a jury to decide. Once again, Chris Cuomo. On February 24th at the Middlesex County Courthouse in New Brunswick, New Jersey, just four days before his 20th birthday, Darun Ravi gets the trial he demanded. 
Curiously, few of the facts of the case are now in dispute. The issue is what was going on inside the heads of Darun Ravi and Tyler Clementi. First, Ravi. It is a question of whether he is a hater. Were his actions motivated by anti-gay bigotry? Tyler's family and prosecutor Julia McClure say yes. These acts were purposeful, they were malicious, and they were criminal. We're going to paint you in the opening statement. This guy is a bully, he is cruel, and he wanted to scare this poor, fragile, gay kid. That was the hardest thing for me to deal with, to have her saying, telling the world that I was mean-spirited and all these like, horrible words to describe me. Cruel. Cruel, yeah. Do you see why the prosecutor feels that that's the right word? I think that's just the way they wanted to paint me. In that dorm? The stakes are high. Conviction could mean 10 years in prison and deportation to his native India. Mr. Altman. Defense attorney Stephen Altman insists his client is no cyber bigot. There was no bullying. No bullying and he never ever did anything to suggest to you that he targeted his roommate for any reason. At times, the witness stand looks like a college recruiting poster, the best and brightest of Rutgers University. These were your friends, these were your intimates. Now they're up there deciding whether or not you are free. I mean, obviously the first few witnesses, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of awkward how to, where to look, what to do. Molly Way, the friend who was there the night Ravi set up his web camera to spy on Tyler for the first time. She cut a deal with prosecutors to testify against him. Clicked a video button and it, and after that popped up an image of um, Tyler and his guest and they are kissing. But she describes Ravi's reaction as one of surprise, not malice. We saw something that we didn't expect to see, and it was just, it just felt weird. Yes, please. Ravi's close friend, Michelle Huang, then took the stand to recount a string of texts she exchanged board. with Ravi soon after that first incident. Said, Did you really see him make out with some guy, LMAO? And what was his response after you said that? He was older and creepy and definitely from the internet. Ravi also texted her that his webcam was aimed at his own bed to keep the gaze away. These emails were taken as a whole, these texts, these communications, to paint a picture of you as somebody who had a problem with this kid on some level because of what he was. The truth is, um, we're just a bunch of kids talking. None of it was being said seriously. We weren't expressing serious feelings, deep feelings that we had. Friends say they never saw any anti-gay bias in Ravi either. They say he seemed to uh, like no. Tyler. Like, he actually told me that uh, Tyler was like a nice guy. He said he didn't have an issue with uh, homosexuals, and that, in fact, he had a really good friend that was homosexual and he had no issue with him at all. But the toughest thing for Ravi's defense to explain is that second attempt to spy on Tyler. Ravi says the second webcam incident wasn't even his idea. He says it was another resident in the dorm who wanted a peep at Tyler Clemente's 30-year-old boyfriend. So he wanted to see the guy, so he says, oh, you should, you should have your webcam like it was on Sunday and um, so, I can, so I can see who this guy is. And so I can see who this guy is or did they want to see Tyler fooling around with this guy? No, no one, no one wanted to see that. I mean, I don't know any of my friends who would want to see, see two guys having sex with each, other, with each other. And that's something that never even entered my mind that anyone would watch it for that. But prosecutors say that's exactly what was on Ravi's mind, and he invited other friends to watch. He says, be careful, it could get nasty. What did the term, it could get nasty, mean to you? Um, meaning I could possibly see um, another man with another man. That other man, the mysterious MB who had sex with Tyler in his dorm room. Ravi suspected he was a predator, but prosecutors consider him another victim of Ravi's spying and intimidation. So he is shielded from courtroom cameras. MB testifies students at Tyler's dorm were staring and laughing, but other witnesses may explain why. I think he described the guy who was invited over um, as someone older. So that was the more scandalous part of why it was scandalous. Ravi is guilty if he purposely intimidated Tyler, 
but under New Jersey law, he's also guilty if Tyler felt intimidated regardless of Ravi's intentions. I do. Thank the you. RA Tyler went to see after finding out he'd been seen kissing a man on webcam wrote this. Tyler is quite upset and feels uncomfortable. Tyler prefers a roommate switch ASAP and would like to see some sort of punishment for Darun Ravi. Also, police say Tyler was obsessively checking Ravi's Twitter page 38 times over two days, including the day he died. He'd been checking from the beginning, like the same way that I Googled him. Because we're curious about each other, we're roommates, we're living together, we want to know. Kind of seems like he was checking your Twitter feed because he was worried about what you're saying. I don't think that's true because um, he'd been checking it since day one. Prosecutors say Ravi tampered with witnesses and evidence, deleting nearly 100 phone and Twitter messages. What was going on in your mind? Why were you doing those things? Um, I was trying to fix what happened. Ravi says at the time he was still thinking the incident was a school infraction, not a police matter. As the jury begins deliberating, Ravi says he feels a measure of satisfaction. What did you think was going to happen? I mean, I don't know. As the trial progressed, I thought, you know, we're doing a good job of getting my story out. This is a verdict that has been reached by all 12 deliberating jurors. Yes. Coming up, a verdict almost as shocking as the allegations. On count one, invasion of privacy. My reaction was, how did they, how did they come up with this? And for the first time, Darun Ravi's message to the Clementi family. A quiet Rutgers campus awaiting the return of students from spring break. A few blocks away at the Middlesex County Courthouse, Darun Ravi is waiting too. What did you think the verdict was going to be? You kind of don't want to let yourself get hopeful, so you kind of don't think about it and just deal with it when it's read. And when it is read, what did you think? I mean, my reaction was, how did they, how did they come up with this? Count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. Count this guilty. was a resounding guilty. Count 15, guilty. All 15 counts. So I couldn't understand how they got me on every single thing. I mean, initially I thought, you know, maybe I'm wrong about myself. Maybe what the prosecution's saying is true, that I'm cruel and hateful and all of this. But then the more I thought about it, I figured maybe they attributed everything to the suicide. Maybe they don't understand the law. Tyler's suicide, the elephant in the courtroom. You weren't supposed to consider the fact that Tyler Clemente's dead, right? Or well, that he took his own life. Is that possible? It did not factor in our decision at all. In what they call a very close case, the decision the jury reached may have had as much to do with what they did not see and hear. First. So if Darun Ravi had a gay friend that he had an open relationship with, you would have seen all of these other things that happened as not being bullying. I would have felt that Tyler would never have the thoughts of being intimidated at all. And the jury never saw a note found in Tyler's backpack. What's on it to characterize it as suicide note, it might be a mischaracterization, but whatever was on it was authored by him, let's say within 12 hours of his, of his death, you would certainly want to see that. And they wouldn't let you see it? No. Look, step to the side, please. Grounds, they say, for an appeal already in the works. Ravi's fight clearly not over. And for Tyler's family, there is no end to the heartache they suffer every day. The trial was painful for us, as it would be for any parent. Ravi never made any public statement, never offered condolences to the Clementis, something he was criticized for. His attorneys insist that was their call. But in this interview, Ravi had something to say. I would just tell him that I thought, you know, he's a very good kid, very nice, and one of the most pleasant people that I've ever met. Um, and yeah, I would just tell them that I, I had no hate and I knew that he didn't hate me either. Do you think you misunderstood Tyler Clemente? Yeah, I think what I thought was about him being quiet and shy, I think I should have tried harder to break through that and get to know him better. In the wake of the verdict, a surprising shift in the media from Ravi the villain 
to Ravi the victim, heated debates over the fairness of the law and how it was applied. This was not your, you know, schoolyard bully who, who grew up, you know, demeaning other people routinely. This was a guy who was more of a prankster than a bully, uh, who had a fascination for, for IT projects uh, and for uh, inventing new kinds of applications and new ways of using his computer, uh, and who had anxieties about uh, going into college, starting college, and having a gay roommate. You don't think he's a hate criminal? I don't think he's a hate. He's not your classic, you know, KKK hate criminal. He's not. And that's what that law was intended for. That's what that law was primarily intended for. No question about that. Even Dan Savage of the It Gets Better campaign has reservations about this case. There was an unseemly rush to pin all responsibility for Tyler Clemente's death on Molly and Ravi to shift all blame onto these two young, foolish, thoughtless teenagers' shoulders. And we need to look to the other events in his life if we want to prevent more cases like this from happening. Those other events may have included difficulty coming out to family and friends. We don't know ultimately what broke Tyler Clemente. It feels like Ravi is being sacrificed for the sins of all, when it really is our entire culture. Now two lives have been destroyed, and no lessons have really been learned. But Steve Goldstein of Garden State Equality says the impact of this case is already being felt. Parents across the country are now talking about bullying with their kids. No parent wants to see his or her kid be the next Darun Ravi and potentially spend time in jail. That is the lesson that this case will have for society. And yet, there is reason to look at this situation as the right message on the wrong case. Sorry, right message, right case. Darun Ravi was a bully. He did make Tyler Clemente's life horrible. This is not a childhood prank. Whatever you think about the verdict Darun Ravi got, it is insensitive to call it a childhood prank. This was malicious bullying. The verdict sheet Still, Goldstein believes the judge should show leniency on sentencing. I believe that the maximum possible sentence of 10 years is way too much. Uh, this is a man who should get a year or two in prison. Even though I wasn't the one that caused him to jump off the bridge, I did do stuff wrong. So you're not saying that you want no punishment? No, I'm not saying that. You could, but you're not. Why? I was stupid about a lot of stuff, so it's only fair. Yeah, I mean, but if you're looking for a heartfelt apology for being a bully, you will not get it from Darun Ravi. Ravi says he would rather go to prison and face deportation than admit any kind of bias or hate. Prison? Kicked out of the country? Yeah. Admit that what you did to Tyler was to intimidate him because he was gay. I need to let the prosecution know, let the other side know that you can't tell me what I'm thinking, and you can't say, this is what you think, this is who you are. I think that message needs to be sent. Back up, back up, folks. And now he's learned the hard way that instead of online, some messages are best delivered in person. Yeah, I just wish I talked to him more because it seemed like the only people he was talking to were people either online that would never ever see him or like strangers he found on the internet. I think maybe if he had someone real life day to day to talk to, it might have helped him. Darun Ravi was later sentenced to 30 days in jail, 300 hours of community service, and three years of probation. As of 2012, Ravi served his time, but he's appealing his conviction and prosecutors are appealing his sentence. U.S. immigration officials say there are no plans to deport him to his native India. Shortly before entering jail to serve his sentence, Ravi issued a public statement in which he apologized to everyone affected by his wrong choices and decisions. He did not mention the Clemente family by name. They, meanwhile, have started a foundation in Tyler's memory. Its goal is to prevent teen suicide and implement anti-bullying programs. When we come back, a small town turns on one of its own. Oh my God, I was wondering what in the world have I done to make this many people upset and mad at me. As a gossip website turns ugly. All I called him was a pervert. But this battle has just begun. 
Stay with us. Now we turn to a story about a gossip website where anybody could say anything. And they did. A virtual graffiti wall. Free punches for anybody with a grudge, real or imagined. In 2012, Chris Cuomo first reported on what happened when an entire town seemed to turn on one man. Welcome to Blairsville, Georgia, population 715. Round here in the heart of the North Georgia mountains, the morning traffic may move slow, but the gossip races along the information superhighway. Something could happen on the north end of town and it could be all over for somebody then got from one side of the town to the other. In Blairsville, you don't need a good seat at the local diner to get the scoop. These days, news is spread on a website called Topics.com. CEO Chris Toll says Topics was created in 2007 to bring more news to small towns. We wanted them to have the ability to make the news better in their town and report on where they lived. But in reality, the site reads much less like a local newspaper and much more like a graffiti wall. On topics, nobody is required to own their defamations. So you have no idea who is saying what. How bad can it get? Just ask Jean Cooley. In 2008, Jean, a divorced father of two boys, had a solid job as a hairstylist and a second chance at love with Paulette Harper. She had a beautiful heart, a beautiful soul. Yet before they could marry, the unimaginable. Paulette's ex murdered her in her sleep. Jean was helping Paulette's family prepare for her funeral when out of nowhere, her family turned on him. They started asking me some unusual questions, asking me about having a drug addiction, being in and out of rehabs. I had no idea of what was going on or why. What was going on was a downright nasty discussion on Blairsville's Topics Forum. What had started as a Topics discussion about Paulette's death had morphed into a feeding frenzy on Gene. He was called a drug addict, a pervert who should be kept away from children, even possibly an accomplice in his fiance's murder. The Topics thread was populated by a venomous chorus of mystery names, mouth, yuck, bugs. It looked like a whole posse of people out to destroy Gene. Oh my God, I was wondering what in the world have I done to make this many people upset and mad at me in my town. Within days, the defamations cost Gene his job. Were you trying to defend yourself? How are you going to defend yourself against somebody who you don't know who it is that's doing the attacking? Scorned, despised, and worried about the impact this all might have on his sons, Gene went into exile. You felt that you had to leave? Yes, sir. He moved south to Augusta, Georgia. He desperately wanted to get even with whomever had ruined him online, but he would need a pit bull to get to the bottom of the anonymous attacks. He's my vicious pit bull. Fortunately for Gene, he found one. Blairsville attorney, Russell Stuckey. I confront people. They want to say something to Russell Stuckey. I'll go to them and I'll say, Chris, here's your chance. You can say it to my face. Despite his gruff exterior, Stuckey was touched by Gene's tale of woe and soon came to regard his new client as a close friend. He was just, uh, he was suicidal. I was, I was worried about him. He quickly discovered unmasking anonymous internet users like Yuck and Mouth would be no easy task. Here's Mouth saying it's all about being a perv. This is absolutely the worst thing you can say about a human being. But Stuckey so was dogged. He figured out he only needed one vital piece of information to unmask anonymous defamers. What was it? The internet protocol address a unique fingerprint connected to every device that accesses the internet. So once you get the IP address, you can go to your telephone companies and say, give me the telephone number it comes back to, and you got them. There's the mouth. It wouldn't happen quickly, but eventually Stuckey's labor would bear fruit. And then we find out who it is. He didn't even know who she was. That's right. The majority of the comments were coming from just one person 
working under multiple screen names. Mouth, yuck, bugs, all the same person. Sybil Denise Balu. Did the name mean anything? No. So we went looking for Balu to find out the basis for all that bile. We found her at her home deep in the woods. I'm Chris Cuomo from ABC. Okay. So where's and she invited us Denise right Denise? onto her porch, um, eager and proud to tell her side of the story. She says all her acrid opinions of Jean stem from an alleged incident 10 years ago when they both worked at a local department store. Well, he touched me inappropriate. And he tells me that he gives wonderful body massages. Any no, chance you did that? No, sir, none whatsoever. No, Balu says uh, after she is. found out about Jean's fiance being killed, she jumped online supposedly to protect Paulette's daughter from him. I mean, that was a big time assassination. He wound up losing his job. Have you ever thought that maybe people, whenever they post on there, that they're telling the truth? You gotta have proof though, Denise. Right, that's the bar, otherwise you wind up in court. All I called him was a pervert. Addict, look into whether it was murder, suicide, he may have had something to do with it. Who's to say? Well, come on now, you can't just suggest somebody may have had something to do with a murder and walk away from it, that's a serious charge. You Who's to that. say? You don't know. But you're supposed to know if you say it. Mean and dumb is always a bad combination. Stuckey was madder than a rained on rooster. He brought Balu to court on charges of defamation. And in court, Balu was unable to come up with any supporting evidence to back her claims. We got a verdict of $404,000. $250,000 of it was punitive damages. You're not taking any of it back. You're not saying any of it's untrue. No, I'm not. Is he going to see one red cent from you? Not one red cent. And what about the man who runs Topics? CEO Chris Tolles refused our request for an interview. He preferred to email us a statement. In it, Tolles writes, Topics does pre-filter user commentary and cooperates with law enforcement while being as respectful as possible with our users' privacy. I don't think they understand that it doesn't just live in this little community. It's over the whole bloody world. And it lives forever. So Russell Stuckey is now on a kind of one-man crusade all over the country, busting the yucks and mouths of the world, trying to use Topics.com to ruin lives. These bastards are doing character assassination, and then they just go tripping off thinking they got away with it. Well, they don't get away with it anymore. In the end, Gene may never see a cent from Balu, but he already got something far more valuable than money or revenge. He got his life back. After his victory in court, Gene returned home to Blairsville. With his name cleared, he found a job waiting and friends eager to welcome him home. Everybody's been really happy that I've been back and I like a lot of support. With what you were able to achieve here, how do you feel about Gene's fortunes going forward? I am happy and proud of him. How will he do here? He'll do great. As of 2012, Gene Cooley is still living in Blairsville, working as a hairstylist and reconnecting with old friends. He still hasn't collected any money from Denise Ballou. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.